to our participants about yourself so that you are the University of Texas at Austin, and we'll be talking about Bayesian parametrics, which is a very exciting field that uh, it was very popular some years ago. It has become a, a bit more obscure in recent times, but hopefully after your session, this will raise a lot of interest and it will help bring back the field to spotlight. Yeah, um, it's faded a little with deep learning, uh, but hopefully um, either this will inspire people to start looking into it. Uh, but also I think some of the ways that we um, think about things in Bayesian non-parametrics can also give you new ways of thinking about other fields, thinking about um, how we manage dimension in um, deep learning, for example, or other areas. So um, even if you don't, I hope you do, uh, start working on Bayesian non-parametrics after this, then hopefully it will still help you in related areas to think differently about problems. Yes. Um, and I'm actually going to spend um, the first hour not talking about BC and non-parametrics, so sorry for the false advertising. Um, I know we've had a lot of uh, Bayesian non-parametric, sorry, a lot, a lot of Bayesian work today. I know um, you all were listening to Tamara Broderick earlier today, and there have been several Bayesian people. Um, but I'm going to be talking maybe from a more um, statistical viewpoint than some of this, so really drilling down into some properties of distributions. And I know while some of you probably have Bayesian or statistic backgrounds coming in, not everyone's going to. So I'm first going to start talking about um, why we do Bayesian inference and how we do Bayesian inference in a parametric setting before getting into the non-parametric. So um, without further ado, let's start with that introduction. So let's start with a really fundamental question here of what does it mean to be Bayesian? Now, this is a question that I ask at the beginning of all of my Bayesian talks. Um, and I get a variety of answers. I'm not sure, I'm not sure whether I can see the chat while I'm looking at this screen. Um, but, uh, Someone says, uh, I believe. I, Oh, perfect. I mean, I've now figured out the technology of being able to see your chat, so that's great. Um, so yeah, we've got have a belief, um, being able to estimate excellent. Um, so being able to estimate uncertainty. I can tell that we've had some uh, Bayesian talks so far, so this is great. Um, no one's um, going for the uh, gotcha, which is what uh, I normally hear first, which is uses Bayes' law. Which is true, Bayesians do use Bayes' law, um, but, Bayesian, but non Bayesians also use Bayes' law. Right? That's a standard tool of um, uh, both Bayesian and frequentist statistics. Um, and expressing uncertainty is also really important. That's one of the comments that we've got. But again, that's something that frequentists do as well. Right? Anyone working with probabilities wants to work with uncertainty in some form. So, um, confidence intervals, which is a standard frequentist tool, also expresses uncertainty. Um, and then we've got a lot of questions which lead on to what I'm about to say, which is actually um, to figure out what it means to be Bayesian, we need to ask a more basic question. What do we mean by probability? And we probably all have an idea of what is meant when I say I have a coin and it's going to return heads with probability 0.4. Okay, that's kind of the first idea of probability we're introduced to. Um, and uh, we know that that means that if we toss the coin repeatedly, the proportion of heads is going to tend to 0.4. Right? We know that if we uh, toss it 10 times, we won't necessarily get four heads, but if we toss it 10,000 times, we're going to get approximately 4,000 heads, um, and so on. That proportion is going to tend to 0.4. And this is the um, frequentist interpretation of probability here. 
the probability directly corresponds to a frequency with which something would happen if we were to repeat it infinitely many times. So it's directly tying the idea of probability with the idea of proportion. Okay. And that's like very clear, very intuitive, but it kind of falls apart when we have a statement such as the probability of alien life existing in this galaxy is 0.4. Now that makes sense to us as a statement that someone could say, but it doesn't make sense to think about it in that classical frequentist way of discussing probabilities. There's only one of this galaxy. We can't rerun the simulation of the universe again and again and again and count how many times there are and aren't aliens. What this statement is, and what several of you have said in the chat, is a statement of degree of belief or degree of certainty. Okay, this is a measure of how the extent to which I believe there is alien life in this galaxy. Now, this may seem a little more wishy-washy, right? Because it's a subjective probability. My belief is going to be different from your belief, is going to be different from a cosmologist's belief. But we can still apply all the rules of probability um, to this definition of belief. Right? And that's what we're going to do. And everything after that in Bayesian versus frequentist statistics follows on from this key difference. Um, if you are interpreting a probability as a proportion or a frequency, that leads to certain things that you're going to do, that makes sense to do. If you're interpreting probability as a measure of belief, um, that leads to other things that you will do. Okay, so we have two views of probability, the frequentist and the Bayesian. Now, a random variable loosely is a variable we can describe using a probability distribution. So if I have a coin and I tell you I'm about to flip that coin, what I get is going to get to be a random variable. And that's true whether I'm a Bayesian or a frequentist. So from a frequentist point of view, I could flip it, well, I couldn't flip it infinitely many times, but I could imagine flipping it infinitely many times and getting a proportion of heads. If I'm a Bayesian, I don't know what it's going to be, but I maybe have some belief based on my prior experience of coins. But moving on to something slightly more complicated, not much more complicated, we'll get more complicated. Um, let's say I have a coin and it has some unknown bias. And I toss it three times, and I'm going to tell you I got heads, heads, tails. I have two variables, uh, the bias P and the sequence X. Um, what I want to know is, um, oh yes, thank you. Uh, I think Rodrigo has just pointed out uh, that there's about to be a quiz on Slido. Um, and there is about to be a quiz on Slido, if you can put that up there. Uh, which of these are random? And which of these are fixed? So, I'm not sure, Rodrigo, I assume you can see when some sufficient number of people have voted on this. Yes, I am looking at it. Some people are uh, voting and Let's wait a bit to share the results. Sure. Oh, okay. Now, I think I was the first to vote. <laughs> so, <laughs> and now it's letting me see it. Um, you're all learning Bayesian non-parametrics and I'm learning Slido. <laughs> Okay, so we seem to have um, the numbers jumping around a little. Um, apparently, we've got a slight majority saying X is random, P is fixed, but it's really um, all answers have uh, a significant amount of support here. Um, 
I'm sorry, I didn't realize that me going to, again, I'm learning Slido. I didn't realize that me going to Slido would interrupt my screen. So apologies about that. Um, so that was kind of a trick question in that all of the answers are somewhat right. Um, it depends what you mean by a probability. So the answer to that question depends whether you're thinking like a frequentist or thinking like a Bayesian. And neither of those are right, so all of the answers are right. So remember the frequentist viewpoint is that something that is random is something that will change um, according to some probability distribution if we repeat it. By contrast, something that's fixed is something that isn't associated with a probability, which means it's not going to change if we repeat it um, the experiment. Whereas from a Bayesian viewpoint, something that's random is something that's uncertain. And something that's fixed or not random must therefore be something that we're certain about. Now, in this case, our sequence of heads, we know what it is. We know we got heads, heads, tails. But it would be different if we repeated the experiment. And our bias is unknown. Right? We don't know the bias, but we know it's a constant. We know it would be the same if we repeated the experiment. We still wouldn't know it if we repeated the experiment, but it wouldn't have changed. The coin, that's a property of the coin. So it follows that if I'm thinking like a frequentist, that something that is uh, random is something that would be different if I repeated it. The sequence of coin tosses is random, but the bias is fixed. But from the Bayesian viewpoint, I'm not uncertain what I saw. Right? I know I saw heads, heads, tails. So that's fixed. I don't know what the bias is. So I have uncertainty about what the bias is. So that is random. And that basically um, is what leads to Bayesian inference. This idea that we have um, uncertain parameters or uncertain components of our models. And that because we use probabilities to express uncertainty, we can put a distribution over those and we can update that distribution as we see more evidence to support um, different values. So this kind of leads to the general recipe for Bayesian inference. And this is going to be what you see um, pretty much any time you see Bayesian inference. Um, sometimes it will be complicated and obscured. Sometimes it will be really obvious, but this is what's always going on under the hood we're gonna come up with some class of models uh, that we feel is rich enough to express the variation in the world. And we're gonna parameterize that by some set of parameters. We don't know what those parameters are because we're not all knowing. So we're gonna put a prior distribution of those parameters that captures our initial beliefs. We might not really have any initial beliefs, in which case we'll put something very vague and uncertain or we might have a lot of um, insider knowledge, we might have experience with the problem, in which case we can express that um, prior belief in this priors. We're then going to see observations um, and we're going to use Bayes' law to update our posterior distribution. Right? So our posterior distribution over the parameters is going to be proportional to our prior distribution times how likely it was we saw um, what we saw. So as a concrete example, let's imagine I am trying to model heights in some population of a country I've never been to. And so I might think, what's a good distribution for heights? Well, most things tend to be bell curved, so I'm going to use a Gaussian. And then I'm going to think a little more and think, well, men tend to be taller than women. So I'm going to use a mixture of two Gaussians. So um, I have a model a mixture of two Gaussians where I don't know the proportion and I don't know the means and variances of those Gaussians. So I'm going to put a prior distribution on those. So maybe I know that most countries have roughly equal men and women. So my prior on the proportions would capture that. Um, and I know that most people are between, say, five foot five and six foot two. 
So maybe I'll put a prior that sort of centers its probability on that for the means. I'll then start measuring people's heights, which might be a little rude when you first visit a new country, but in this example, we're gonna do that. And then I'm gonna use Bayes' law to update my posterior distribution over what those proportions are and what those means and variances are. But the challenge here, and the key to making this work nicely, is picking a good prior. Right? So in that case, I went with something that seemed reasonable, uh, but maybe it's not flexible enough. Right? If my model isn't flexible enough to capture something close to the truth, I'm never going to get that truth. So in this example, I assumed that there were going to be two clusters that I hypothesized were for men and women, but maybe that's not enough. So maybe I know that we have, um, for example, different average heights for different races. Uh, so maybe I should have more than two clusters. Um, and this is something we see in a lot of modeling problems. We know we want to do some sort of clustering or dimensionality reduction. Uh, we just don't know what the appropriate dimension is. So if I wanted to do a topic model of the New York Times, I don't know what the right number of topics in the New York Times is. And if I'm learning that topic model on a fairly small training set, I might not have captured all, I might not have seen all the topics before, right? If I trained on the uh, um, New York Times from 2019, I probably would not have topics for COVID-19 and pandemic and um, all, all of the things that have happened since then. So Bayesian nonparametrics is going to give us a framework for having flexible priors. And in particular, it's going to be flexible in terms of this latent dimensionality. So what do we mean by nonparametric? The first time I heard nonparametric Bayes, I, I feel fairly reasonably assumed that was um, Bayesian inference without any parameters. And that's not quite true. It's kind of a misleading name. So let's first think what we mean when we say a parametric model. Well, yes, it's a model that has parameters, but in a Bayesian context, specifically, it's a model with a fixed pre-specified set of parameters. So that mixture of two Gaussians that we discussed, that's a parametric model with five parameters, two means, two variances, and one probability vector which decides the proportions of the two clusters. If we're doing linear regression in a Bayesian context, that's also a parametric model. We have a fixed dimensional vector beta, which is going to give us our intercept and our slopes, and we have a uh, variance sigma squared, which is going to tell us what the residual variance is going to be. A non-parametric model is one where we have a, um, we don't have a fixed pre-specified number of parameters, but instead the number of parameters can grow with the data set size. Right? So we still have parameters, we just have an unbounded number of them. And we do this by saying, okay, we're going to assume a priori that we have infinitely many parameters. So instead of having two components in our mixture model, we're going to assume we have infinitely many components. Instead of having a finite dimensional parameter vector beta, we're going to have an infinite dimensional parameter vector beta. Now, this sounds like it introduces more problems than it solves because infinity um, is really big. Uh, but we're going to see that actually this gives us something that we can work with in a reasonable manner. So before we get into how we work with these infinite dimensional objects, I want to drill down a little into how we work with um, parametric models. I'm going to focus um, today on that mixture modeling case 
uh, because that has a lot of the properties that we're going to be interested in. So here's a data set. And I want to model it using a Bayesian model. Now, in this case, the dimensionality is pretty clear. Right? There seem to be three um, clearly defined components, um, and they look fairly Gaussian. Spoiler, that's because I generated it from a mixture of three Gaussians. Uh, so I don't need to worry too much about the number of components. I'm going to just use a mixture of three Gaussians. So I have seven parameters there, three means, three covariances, and a probability vector that gives the probability of belonging to each component. And so explicitly, I've assumed that given these parameters, the data was generated by repeatedly sampling one of the three clusters according to that probability, and then looking at the mean and covariance for that cluster, and then sampling a data point from a multivariate normal with that mean and covariance. Now, to finish off my model, I also need to put priors over those um, means, covariances, and over that probability vector. Okay. And we'll hold off for now on what those priors are and start looking into that in a couple of slides. Now, once we set this up, then we can start doing fun things. Okay. So I've specified my prior. Here I've assumed that the prior on each of the clusters is the same. So the overall prior is the, probab and is the probability of the proportions times the probability of each uh, component's parameters. I know the likelihood of my data. Right? I know that I'm assuming the data was generated according to a uh, mixture model that I just specified. I can integrate out these uh, prior distributions to get the overall marginal probability of my data. And then if I want to update my uh, beliefs about the parameters, I can use Bayes' law to get my posterior distribution, the probability of those parameters, conditioned on what I've seen. And so here I'm just using Bayes' law, probability of A given B is probability of B given A times probability of A divided by probability of B. So that's all great. And this equation is most of Bayesian inference. The trick comes in that integrating is hard. Um, and sometimes it can be like beyond hard and intractable. So in order to calculate this posterior in general, we need to be able to do this integral to get the marginal. And yeah, integrating sucks and sometimes is not tractable. Uh, but sometimes we can make this easier by choosing particular choices of priors. So let's consider that prior distribution over the proportions pi. We're going to use a distribution um, known as the Dirichlet distribution. So um, hopefully some of you have come across the Dirichlet distribution, um, but probably there are some people who this is new to, and probably there's an in-between stage of people who've come across it but haven't really thought about what it means. So for those in the first class who haven't come across the Dirichlet distribution, this is your lucky day, it's a great distribution. Um, it's a distribution technically over the k minus one dimensional simplex, which is just a fancy way of saying uh, probability vectors of length k. Right? k minus one dimensional simplex, because once you know the first k minus one elements of a probability vector, you know the final element. And it basically is the same as the beta distribution, which you probably know as a distribution over probabilities, but it extends this to a uh, multivariate case where instead of having a distribution over um, a binary probability, you have a distribution over a multivariate probability. And it's parameterized by a vector of um, positive numbers. 
And if we take this vector of positive numbers, alpha, and we normalize it, that gives the expectation of the Dirichlet. Right? So here on the left, I have a representation. So each of these triangles is a representation of a three-dimensional probability vector. Right? Um, so the corners correspond to 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, um, 0, 0, 1. And then the very center corresponds to a third, a third, a third. And if we have alpha equals one, 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 then that's actually just the uniform dimension, uniform distribution on the two simplex, on the space of all three dimensional probability vectors. And you know, that, that extends. If I had Dirichlet one, 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 that would be uniform on the three simplex and so on. So in this case, my expected um, sample is going to be the probability vector a third, a third, a third, but all probability vectors are equally likely. Now on the right, I have alpha is five, one, one, right? So I have, um, if I normalize that, I can see that I'm more likely, I'm expected to get something that has highest probability on the first component. And that's what we see here on the right. This is the PDF over the simplex, and it's concentrated on that first corner. And then in the middle, we have something that's concentrated somewhere between the second corner and the third corner. Right? So alpha, if we normalize it, gives us our best guess for what that probability distribution is. So if I'm not, not sure, I'll probably just go one, one, one. Now, the relative values tell us the expectation. The size of the alphas tell us how much variance we're going to get between samples. So it's kind of like an inverse variance, this total sum of the alphas. Um, the larger this sum is, the less difference is going to be between repeat samples. So here I've got, um, again, three uh, Dirichlet distributions, they all have expectation, a third, a third, a third. Uh, okay, so I'd started talking about the inverse variance. Um, okay, let's, so recap, we had the Dirichlet distribution, it has the parameter alpha. Um, uh, normalizing that gives us our expected value and um, then if we increase the magnitude of the alpha, we're going to tend to get less variation between the samples. So in this case, they're all going to be closer to a third, a third, a third. And if we decrease it, we're going to get more variation. So we're more likely to get things like 0 0.9, 0 0 0.05, 0 0.05. So, the Dirichlet distribution has a number of nice properties that are going to make it really convenient to work with. So this is what the PDF of the Dirichlet looks like. Right? We have um, some normalizing constant that depends on the alphas, and then we've got a product of terms involving the actual uh, probabilities. And we're going to use this, remember, in a clustering model. So we're assuming that um, our cluster indicators were generated by sampling IID from the pi that we got out of this. So the overall likelihood conditioned on pi is going to be um, the product over all the pi's of that entry of pi to the number of times we've seen that component. So here, m sub k is just going to be the number of times we've picked component k. Now, um, we want to look at the posterior distribution. Posterior is going to be proportional to our prior times our likelihood. Right? So I'm going to drop the normalizing constant in the Dirichlet and just directly multiply the Dirichlet prior and that multinomial likelihood. And we get something that looks um, pretty similar to what we started with. Right? So this posterior seems to be proportional to 
our original uh, form, except instead of having alpha k minus one, we've got alpha k plus the number of times we've seen component k minus one. So this means that it must be a Dirichlet distribution. It's proportional to a Dirichlet distribution with updated parameters. And we know that the only distribution proportional to a Dirichlet distribution is a Dirichlet distribution, because all distributions have to integrate to one. So we know that our posteria is again a Dirichlet distribution with updated parameters. And this is convenient because we've managed to sidestep side doing that integral in Bayes' law. So now we can easily do inference, update our distributions without having to integrate anything. And this is something that you may have come across before. It's known as conjugacy. Um, it's a class of priors where if we combine that prior with an appropriate likelihood model, we can get the posterior by just combining the parameters of the prior and the observations without having to do any integration. And with this, we can then do inference fairly easily. So let's say I know the cluster assignments of each data point and I want to figure out um, the distribution over pi. Well, I know that's a Dirichlet distribution conditioned on these um, cluster allocations, and I can sample from that distribution. Then, once I've sampled the value of pi, um, if I fix the values of the means and covariances, then I can sample from the posterior distribution over the cluster allocations, right? Uh, that's going to be proportional to the prior probability of it belonging to a certain cluster, which is the pi k, times the likelihood, which is our normal. And then I can pick conjugate priors again on the mean and the inverse, oh, sorry, and the, and the covariance. And that will allow us to do something similar to update the uh, mean and covariance parameters for each cluster. And then we can cycle through sampling the pi's sampling the means and covariances, sampling the cluster allocations, and that will eventually converge to give us samples from the posterior. So um, if you're familiar with Bayesian inference, this is what's known as a Gibbs sampler. I'm not going to focus a huge amount on inference today, um, but this is a property that allows us to work with this in a nice manner. Um, now, we've come up with a distribution over pi, but rather than explicitly instantiating it like we did here, we can also integrate that out. Now, conditioned on pi, we assumed that the observations, the cluster indicators were independent, right? They were all IID samples from pi. If we integrate out pi, they're no longer independent, right? And we can do that math, and we end up with this form for the conditional distribution of uh, the cluster indicator for the ith data point conditioned on all the previous. Now, rather than think too much about this integration, we're going to represent this in terms of an urn analogy. So if you get any further into Bayesian non-parametrics, you'll find out that we love urn analogies. So imagine I have an urn. Now, I'm not very good at drawing, so my urn is a square. Um, and I am going to put in that urn k different colored balls. So here I've got orange, gray, and blue. And each of those balls are going to be um, size of the corresponding alpha parameter. So here I pick them all to be the same size. I'm then going to reach into that urn and I'm going to pick out a ball with probability proportional to its size. So here I picked a gray ball out. I'm going to return that ball to my urn, and I'm also going to return a new ball of size one, which is the same color. Then I'm going to do the same again. So here I've reached in, I've picked a blue ball proportional to its color, proportional to its size. I'm going to return that plus 
a new size one blue ball. And then maybe next time I pick one of the new balls, I reintroduce it plus another blue ball. And in this manner, I can build up a data set. Okay, so um, let's now move on to the second poll in the Slido. It's already live. So it's already can... live, excellent. Okay, so let's say we're starting with just two balls in there, both of size alpha. And I'm gonna sample 20 samples from that scheme. If I increase alpha, what's going to happen? Am I going to get more balance between blue and red? Less balance between blue and red? Or is it going to be um, basically the same? I'll return to my picture of my urn so you can see that. Now, because I've returned to the picture, I can't see my Slido, so Rodrigo, I will let you tell me when we've got some answers. <laughs> yes, I will. So as you're thinking about it, you might find it helpful to go back to the very first draw where we picked out that one gray ball and think about um, if you started from here but increased or decreased the size of the original balls, how is that going to affect how many gray balls you expect to see? So the uh, first option was um, that alpha will not affect the value. Okay, so um, okay, let me put an answer in. Okay, so. Looks like we've got three answers so far, um, sneaking peeks. Um, so let's maybe uh, wait a moment and see. Oh, have we gone on to the second question? Uh, yes, actually. So we Oh, have I'm sorry. I, I thought we were still on the first. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> The polls both look very similar, so I got lost. Okay, so let's maybe talk about that first question then. Um, mea culpa. Uh, so I was asking if we have um, two balls, red and blue, um, how is the pro final proportion of red and blue going to change as we increase the alpha? So let's first imagine we had two, um, those two initial red balls were size 0.001, right? Tiny, tiny red and blue balls. We're going to pick one of them and let's say it's blue. We're then putting in a size one blue ball along with those two tiny red and blue balls. Once that happens, we're going to pick the blue one again, right? Because we've got a mass of 1.01 blue and 0 0.01 of red. So we're going to keep getting that blue. Occasionally we'll get the red, but we're going to keep getting that blue because the mass of that first ball that we put in overwhelms the mass of the original like starter balls. On the other hand, if we had two initial balls of size 100, first maybe we pick out a red. We'll put that back in and we'll put a ball of size 1 back in. We're still roughly just as likely to pick red or blue. Right? So the larger alpha is, the larger these original balls are, um, the more um, similarity there's going to be between the different components. Right? Whereas as it gets smaller, um, the weight of those original balls is going to get drowned out by the signal of what we see. So we're going to end up with um, 
either a huge number of red and very few blue or a huge number of blue and very few red, depending on which one we started with. So the question that we then moved on to, which I didn't realize we'd moved on to, um, was, uh, okay, let's imagine we have a larger number of initial balls. Let's say we have 20 initial balls. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to repeatedly sample. Now imagine you have those initial balls being size uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.01. You're going to pick one event, one of them, and then let's say we pick the first. You put that 0 0.01 ball back, you put that size one new ball in, and now suddenly you're way more likely to pick that first one again. Right? So we're going to see that uh, first ball disproportionately more often because it's starting to overwhelm the probabilities. That means if we only pick out um, 20 times, we're not going to get that many different values because it's going to keep tending to pick that first one because we've added more balls in. By contrast, if we started off with um, 20 size 100 balls, maybe again, we first pick the first one, we put it back, and we put in a unit size ball. We're still fairly likely to pick um, a different option because while the first color has mass 101, the second color has mass 100, the third color has mass 100. So as those alphas increase, we're going to tend to get more um, clusters come out in a finite number of samples. So um, do we have, is there any questions on that? That's kind of, it, like looking at your server responses, that maybe isn't what your intuition said, um, which is good. Probability sometimes is a little unintuitive. Uh, but that, does that make sense as to um, why changing the ball's original size will change what's likely to happen next? And I'll note that this is exactly the same thing as we saw on those pictures of the simplex. As the alphas increased, we were more likely to get our probability be a third, a third, a third. As they decreased, we were more likely to have them closer to one, zero, zero, or zero, one, zero, um, and be more concentrated on one of the um, clusters. Okay, so more questions, yet more chances for me to get slider right. <laughs> um, okay, so and I think for this one, actually, um, oh sure, let's do the poll. Um, so in my example, I happened to first pick out a gray ball. Right? That was my first thing that I sampled. Does the fact that the first ball was gray um, change the probability of subsequent balls being gray? Does it um, change the expected number of gray balls I get after that? Okay, so looking at the numbers so far, the consensus seems to be, um, let's see, a few more to come in. Um, but the majority seem to be saying that yes, the probability of the ice ball being gray does indeed depend on um, how many of the previous balls were gray. And yes, that's true, right? As we're going into our urn, um, if we've already seen um, 10 gray and uh, zero black or blue, sorry, I forgot what color was there, we're more likely to hit a gray than if we'd seen um, zero gray and 10 blue. We have more gray balls in there, so we're more likely to pull out a gray ball again because there is more total mass of grayness in our earth. So this means that in this urn representation, where we've integrated out pi, our observations aren't iid, right? The cluster allocation of the ith uh, component 
does depend on the cluster allocations of everything we've seen before. Right? And this is because we've integrated out um, the underlying probability vector. Uh, now we have this conditional um, dependence. So that then raises a slightly more subtle question. Does changing the order of my sequence matter? So am I equally likely to pick three gray balls, then one blue ball, and then one orange ball, as one orange ball, one gray ball, one blue ball, one gray ball, one gray ball? Or are those going to have different probabilities? So this is a little more of a subtle question. Um, and you might want to um, think about sort of sketching out what the probability of the um, different outcomes is going to look like mathematically. Okay, so we're still going through that. Let's give it a few more minutes because they're pretty, currently yes and no are pretty close. Um, so maybe you can be the deciding factor in which one wins. And I say, I like that no one is going for don't know. I like that everyone's being bold in their choices. Although it's totally fine to say that you don't know. Um, but I like everyone's confidence. That's really important. Okay, so as I'm looking at it now, um, I'm seeing that the majority have gone for yes. The probabilities are the same. So let's take a look. Let's try... Um, okay, so the way I've written this, no, I, this was bad slide writing of mine. Yes, they are the same. No, the order doesn't matter. So the majority of you were right. Um, so let's look at why. Uh, the first time we picked out a gray ball, that had probability of the size of the original gray ball over the sum of the sizes of the original balls. Next, if we pick out another gray ball, uh, we now have one size alpha gray ball and one size one ball in there. So the probability of picking another gray is going to be proportional to that total gray mass over all of the total weight of the balls in there. Then we're going to pick another gray. That happens with probability proportional to that initial gray ball plus the two unit balls that we've got in, because we've just had two grays, divided by the total mass. Then if we pick a blue one, that's probability proportional to that original blue ball, again, divided by the total mass, and so on. And I can write that down for any other sequence. Um, uh, And I've totally messed up the numbers on that sequence, which I didn't notice when I was doing my run through. Um, but the probability of the first one will be the, prob the size of a green ball divided by the total mass of the other green other balls um, times the size of the red ball divided by the total mass of the other balls, and so on. So in each case, we are going to um, end up with the same numerators and the same denominators, just in different orders. So you'll see that the denominators are the same because that's just the mass after adding zero, one, two, three balls. Um, we're going to pick a gray ball three times. So that means we're going to have one time where the probability of picking it is proportional to that initial gray ball, one time where it's proportional to that initial gray ball plus one, one time where it's proportional to that initial gray ball um, plus two. So the overall probability doesn't change it, and this um, is a property that you'll come across a lot in Bayesian inference called exchangeability. So we're in this situation where yes, the probability of the ith ball being a certain color does depend on the previous balls, but if we take the probability of the whole sequence and shuffle that order, the probability doesn't change. Now, this is a 
um, property that makes it really handy to work with um, this Dirichlet distribution. Because it means that um, we know that we can always treat a ball as if it was the last one we saw. Right? When we're considering the probability of a data point belonging to a cluster, we can pretend it was the last one we saw and conditioned on the, um, all of the other data points. So we can rearrange our data points so that we're always looking at the last one. And this is going to be a really convenient property when doing inference. It, it makes it very easy to, um, rather than deal with the entire data set at once, break it down into individual subproblems. So we're only looking at the conditional distribution of one cluster given everything else. So, um, we spent a long time on the Dirichlet distribution. I'm going to cover very quickly two more properties, and then I'm going to suggest we take a quick break, um, go and get a glass of water, um, shake your legs before we return to non-parametrics. Uh, but first, I'm going to introduce two um, important properties that we're going to make use of after that break. The first is what's called the agglomeration property. And this says if we have a k-dimensional Dirichlet, we can squish elements together to get a smaller probability vector. And that smaller probability vector is still going to be um, a Dirichlet random variable. So let's say I have a k-dimensional probability vector that I've sampled from a Dirichlet with parameters alpha one through alpha k. I can take the first two elements and sum those together, right? That gives me a k minus one length vector. If I do that, then um, that vector is going to be also Dirichlet distributed uh, with parameters where the first parameter is the sum of those first two original parameters and all the other parameters are the same. So if you're stuck with nothing to do tonight, this is actually fairly easy to prove um, from that uh, definition of the Dirichlet that we saw earlier. Um, but I'm not going to, go, going to go into the proof because we got enough math for today. And then the second property is going to be the opposite. Right? So the agglomeration said we can take a k-dimensional probability vector and squish elements together and still have a Dirichlet distribution. It makes sense that we can do the opposite. We can take a short uh, probability vector and separate the components out so as we have something longer. Now this is a little trickier because there's only one way you can add two numbers together. But once you've got that number, there are infinitely many ways you can split it in two. Um, so the way this is going to work is, let's say I have a k-dimensional probability vector and I want to split the first element in two. And I'm going to sample a beta random variable um, whose parameters are going to be the parameter of that first element times some number b between zero and one. And then the second one is gonna be the parameter of that first element times one minus that b. And then gonna use that proportion, to split the first element. And that then is going to give me a expanded Dirichlet distribution where the parameters are that first element times that b, that first element times one minus b, and then the remaining elements. Okay, so that's been an awful lot of information about the Dirichlet distribution, um, but that's going to give us the framework that we need to move on in a few minutes to the infinite dimensional and, and, and the analog of the Dirichlet distribution, which is the Dirichlet process. Uh, let's move on to some actual non-parametrics. So the Dirichlet distribution is a great distribution. It, it has a lot of ways of thinking about it we've looked at. It has nice properties such as conjugacy, um, but it has got this fixed choice of k. Right? So we have, in everything we've seen so far, explicitly assumed we know how many clusters we want, and then we picked a Dirichlet distribution of that size. 
And that was fine in our previous example where there were clearly three clusters. But sometimes it's hard to tell. So sometimes we get data that looks kind of like this. Um, and it's hard to know what the right number of clusters is. So maybe I think there's um, three clusters here, right? So I've colored those in uh, green, red, um, green, black, and red. But maybe I think there's more than that. Maybe I think these outliers over here are a different cluster in blue. Or maybe there's actually seven clusters, right? And there's this long yellow cluster over here and this pink and, um, cyan, and uh, cyan cluster here, right? Um, it's hard in these cases where you have a lot of overlapping clusters, some of which are smaller than others, to know how many components to use. And this is going to be particularly true in cases that aren't two-dimensional um, Gaussian data, where you can't just eyeball it and guess. And even if I have gotten a good guess of how many, cl how many clusters there are in this data set, that might not be all the clusters that exist in the entire population. Okay, so here I have a couple of hundred data points. And maybe seven data points is the right number of data point, number of clusters for that. But maybe if I gathered another thousand data points, I would start seeing more clusters that weren't in my initial training set. So a good rule of thumb to deal with both of these, the how many clusters are there and have I seen all my clusters, is to make sure that we're going to have more clusters than we actually need. So, so far, we've been working with finite dimensional mixture models where we have K components. But we want to make sure that we never run out of components. So, we're going to make sure K is really big. And when I say really big, we're going to make sure K is infinitely big. We're going to make sure that no matter how many data points we have, we can never run out of clusters. And we can write this down, right? We can write down this likelihood instead of being a mixture of K, we've now got infinitely many components. So infinitely many probabilities um, and infinitely many means and covariances. And this sounds like it would be a terrible idea because we don't have infinitely many computational resources. It is impossible for us to represent infinitely many uh, means and covariances. Um, so this seems like it would be a non-starter to begin with. However, we're working with a clustering model. And in this case, every data point can only belong to at most one cluster. So we know that even though we have an infinitely large mixture model, in practice, we're only gonna see at most n clusters. And also, it would be a really bad mixture model if we always had the same number of clusters as we had data points. Right? That's not really a clustering model. In practice, we're going to have fewer clusters, almost always, than we have uh, data points. And this is going to arise naturally if we have some of our probabilities, some of our pies, being bigger than others. Right? If you have uh, one pi that is size 0.5 and all of the rest are vanishingly small, we're going to see that size 0.5 cluster more often than we see the other clusters. So having this infinite dimensional mixture model means that no matter how much data we see, we can always add more clusters, there's always more room, uh, but we're still, in practice, going to only be seeing a finite number of clusters. At most, the number of data points, but in practice, it's going to be some random number lower than that value. Okay, so some, something here said KDE uses N Gaussians. Um, so, and that does work fine. And yes, I'm not saying, so, and that also, so KDE 
um, actually is an example of a non-parametric model, right? We have an increasing number of components as we grow. Here though, I am explicitly wanting to do a clustering model, right? I am wanting to uh, draw similarity. I'm wanting to have a model that is more like a finite mixture model where I am learning some structure. So yes, a KDE does work absolutely fine for density estimation, but it doesn't tell us these two data points belong to the same cluster and these two do. So yes, um, that's a very good question. Um, we don't need the clustering if we're not interested in making use of it. Okay, so let's assume we do want um, a clustering model um, that has these properties. We're gonna want something that is like a Dirichlet prior, but has an infinite number of components. And we're going to sneak up on this using that decimation property that we introduced um, using the break, where we started with a finite, a k-dimensional Dirichlet, and then just kept splitting the components. And I'm gonna start off with the smallest one we can get, which is two-dimensional. Um, and I'm going to specifically say this is a Dirichlet alpha over two, alpha over two for some alpha. So that's actually a beta, alpha over two, alpha over two because remember the Dirichlet is the multivariate beta. And so then I have uh, got a two-dimensional probability vector. Um, here they're about 0.68 and 0.32. I'm then gonna recurse on each of these. And I'm going to um, split them using that beta splitting rule. All right, so I'm gonna take the first one, I'm gonna sample theta one, which is a beta random variable um, where the parameters are the original parameter for that first one, which is alpha over two times B and alpha over two times one minus B. And I'm just gonna take B be a half for all of this to make it easier. If I do this, I now have a four dimensional Dirichlet distribution whose parameters are alpha over four, alpha over four, alpha over four, etc. And I can do that again. So now I'm going to split each of those four components to get um, a Dirichlet alpha over eight, alpha over eight, alpha over eight, etc. And I'm just going to keep splitting. Right? Uh, 32, 64, 128. Um, and you can kind of imagine doing this and sort of squinting as it gets fuzzy and we get to infinity. Um, and we're going to end up with a infinite dimensional vector as k goes to infinity, where each individual um, prior component is going to tend to zero. And for most of the times that you're using a Dirichlet process, it's conceptually fine to sort of think of it like this as a really, really big Dirichlet um, distribution, where as you're increasing the number of components, you're decreasing those individual uh, probabilities. Right? And we need to decrease it because if we kept them constant, um, they'd go to in the, the total um, mass would go to infinity. Oh, that was a few more divisions there. Okay. So I can take my Dirichlet distribution and I can expand it, expand it, expand it, expand it, all the way to being an infinite dimensional vector. And then I can combine that with some mechanism for generating the parameter values. Um, this is exactly what we did in the k-dimensional uh, mixture model. Uh, we picked a mean and a covariance from some distribution and associated that with each component. Um, we're going to combine that here. So first we're going to sample our probability vector and then we're going to pick some distribution over our parameters and we're going to sample our um, component parameters from that distribution. Right? So the Dirichlet process is this combination of an infinite dimensional uh, Dirichlet and a mechanism for picking parameters for each component. 
right? So we specify it in terms of these two parameters, alpha, which is that uh, value that we used in our original Dirichlet, and h, which is some distribution over our parameters space. Now, two things that we're going to see from this, or one thing that we're going to see from this is that we end up with a probability distribution on this space of um, the space theta, which is whatever our distribution h is on, and it's going to be discrete. Right? We um, have infinitely many atoms of probability, um, so we end up with a discrete probability distribution. And we write this as um, G, which is our discrete probability distribution, is sampled from a Dirichlet process with parameters alpha and H. So H here was determining the locations of these parameters. Now that might look a little weird because our sample here in black does not look anything like our continuous distribution H, but it's basically governing where each of them is individually sampled from, right? So this means not that it's gonna look like that Gaussian, but that it's going to tend to have more atoms where the Gaussian has more mass. And then that concentration parameter alpha, um, that gives us the distribution over atom sizes. So remember in our um, basic Dirichlet, the larger alpha was, the more similar the components were, right? We were going to get closer to equal probabilities. So if we go back to our splitting, this means each the larger alpha is, the less difference there is between each side of the split at each side. So this means we're going to end up, um, like we have here on the right, with something that has a much more balanced number of, a balanced set of atom sizes. As alpha shrinks, those splits are going to become much more divergent. Right? So we're much more likely to have the situation where we have a huge amount of mass on one component and much, much smaller mass on the other components. And then once we've got this, it can behave in exactly the same way as we used our Dirichlet distribution. Right? So just like we assumed before that we had a probability vector sampled from a Dirichlet, and a set of um, component probabilities. Now we're going to sample that infinite dimensional vector and that infinite dimensional set of probability vectors. Um, and then for each observation, we're gonna do exactly what we did before. We're gonna sample a cluster indicator given by the sizes of the atoms. Then we're gonna look where that atom is to get our mean and covariance. And then we're gonna sample from that Gaussian. I'm assuming here that we're working with Gaussians. Obviously, this extends to other forms of distributions. So this still seems like it's going to be a mess, right? I've given you a way of coming up with something infinite dimensional, and then I've told you you should just sample from that. And that's not going to work, right? Because as we've described before, we only have infinite resources. But the reason we spent so long on properties of the Dirichlet distribution is because we can use some of those properties to help us both understand what's going on here and represent it in a finite dimensional manner. Okay, so remember at the end, just before the break, we talked about the agglomeration property. So if I have a big Dirichlet, I can sum together elements and get a smaller Dirichlet. So let's say I have my Dirichlet process, my infinite dimensional Dirichlet on, let's say, the line. I can partition that line into k components and sum up the masses in each. So this is what I've done here. I've got my Dirichlet process on top, infinitely many atoms, and then in the line below, I've picked a random partition and I've just summed up the mass in each partition. And then below again, I picked a different partition and I've summed up the mass in that partitions. And in each cases, these um, like blobby blue masses are samples from a finite dimensional 
um, Dirichlet distribution where the parameters are alpha times the uh, mass of that original partition. So how does this help us? Well, remember we saw that if we had a Dirichlet distribution and then we see observations, samples from a multinomial, then our posterior distribution is also going to be a Dirichlet distribution. And this is true for each of these blobby distributions, for each of these agglomerated combined Dirichlet distributions. So if I sample a atom, can you see my cursor here? Uh, no, we cannot see your cursor. Or oh, okay. Yes, but it's a very small cursor. Maybe I'll maybe I'll just like move it a lot. So if I sampled a, a um, uh, value of x here, um, then in my finite dimensional Dirichlet, that would be the same as sampling an observation in this block in this partition and this block in this partition. Right. And then the posterior for this middle partition um, for this block will then be my original parameter for that block plus one. Similarly, my posterior for this partition at the bottom will be my original parameters for that plus one. And this is going to be true for any possible way I can partition it. Right? Um, so this, mm, I've messed up how I'm talking to slide. Um, so this both gives us a alternative way of thinking about the Dirichlet process. It is um, the distribution that gives us um, Dirichlet marginals for every partition. Uh, but also more importantly, it allows us uh, to consider what the posterior distribution is. So wherever I sample an observation, um, I know that the posterior in that partition is going to be plus one. The only way that this can work is if my posterior distribution um, is also a Dirichlet process. Right? So every partition I know gives me a Dirichlet. Um, if I add one observation to each of those um, partitions, the posterior must also again be a Dirichlet. Because the, because the partition is a Dirichlet, going back to the infinite dimensional space, the posterior must also be a, Gauss, a Dirichlet process. And in fact, as a consequence of this, if I have a Dirichlet process prior, and I see one observation, my posterior is also going to be a Dirichlet process where I have added one to that concentration parameter, and I've added a point mass where I saw that observation to my base measure H. Okay, so We've just seen two sort of infinite dimensional ways of thinking about the Dirichlet distribution. Um, but let's see if we can make that into a more interpretable finite dimensional representation. So remember for the Dirichlet, we saw that we could, instead of working with pi, we could integrate that out and work with an Ern scheme. Right? And we could think about um, what do samples look like as we draw balls out of an Ern. And we can do something similar for the Dirichlet process. Okay. Um, so I can take my posterior distribution over the Dirichlet process. Um, I'm actually going to slip this, skip this and move just straight to the um, picture part in the interest of math. Um, we can describe, sorry, in the interest of time because of the amount of time that I spent offline <laughs> due to my internet problems. Um, I can think of samples from this Dirichlet process using a variant of the Ern scheme that we saw before. So here, instead of starting with k balls, I'm going to start with one giant ball of size alpha. I'm going to put that in my Ern. I'm then going to pick a ball with probability proportional to its size. There's only one ball in there, so I'm picking that one. I'm then going to um, check whether it's the black ball 
If it's the black ball, I'm going to sample a new color from my distribution over colors. And I'm going to return that black ball plus a unit size ball of the same color of the new color to the earth. I'm then going to repeat. So now I'm going to pick a ball with probability proportional to its size. And let's say this time I picked that burgundy one. Now I'm just going to return that ball plus a second ball of the same color. And I'm going to do this again. So now I've got the one black and the two burgundy balls. Let's say I pick the black one again. I'm now going to sample a new color from my distribution over colors. And I'm going to return that black ball and the new color to the earth. And I can keep doing this. So sampling a color, returning it, or sampling the black ball and returning a new color. Um, and this is going to build up a distribution over colors where I always have some probability of picking a new color. Right? So no matter how many balls are in this urn, uh, there's always some probability that I'm going to reach in and take out that black ball. Okay, so let's um, move on to a poll question on this. And the question is going to be, what's going to happen if I increase the size of that black ball? Right, am I going to get more or fewer unique colors in N samples? Okay. Um, I have a question on this slide, which I'll come to after we've um, discussed this. So here we've said, uh, we've, the poll so far, we have a 100% um, set of people saying, if we increase the size of the black ball, we're going to increase the expected number of colors. Um, which, yes, this is true. We add a color every time we pick the black ball. The larger that ball is, the more likely we are to pick it. So the larger that ball is, the more likely we are to add a new color. And this fits with what we saw before, that the larger the alpha was, um, the more uh, sizable probabilities we would have. And we saw that if alpha was really small, we would tend to end up with just one cluster dominating and maybe a few small ones. So if alpha is really small relative to one, once we've picked that first other color out, we're much more likely to see that again. So someone asked in the questions um, and said, uh, we still implicitly define the expected number of clusters um, through alpha in, Dirichlet process, in the Dirichlet process. Do we really win something? And that's a great question. So yes, we are, um, basically we are implicitly uh, putting a distribution over the number of components that we have. Um, so on the one hand, yes, that's more flexible than being dogmatic, right? So uh, we are basically being Bayesian in a sense about the number of components. Now, a good question you could ask here is, well, there are other ways of doing that. I could put a Poisson distribution over the number of components. Would that give the same thing? Right, so I could say I'm going to um, put a Poisson distribution over K, and that then allows me to have many, as many components as I want. Now that is actually going to behave slightly differently, and sometimes that's going to be a really good modeling choice. Uh, but inherent in that idea is um, kind of the idea that we're going to converge to a final number of components, right? That there is a true answer for the number of components and that that is a fixed number. Kind of inherent in the Dirichlet and in all of Bayesian non-parametrics is the idea that there always might be something else around the corner, right? So even if um, man, I can't count quickly enough to see how many colors there are there. Um, even if we've seen 10 clusters so far in the 1,000 data points we've seen so far, um, 
the Bayesian non-parametric way of thinking about things is thinking, well, there always may be something around the corner. Right? You're implicitly saying, I don't think we're ever going to see all of the variation that there possibly can be. And if you know that you can't see all of the variation that possibly can be, it doesn't make sense to put an explicit prior on a finite number of clusters. Now, that's going to be not the appropriate case, not appropriate for certain um, situations. Sometimes you know there is a finite number, you just don't know what it is. Right? In those cases, putting the Dirichlet, uh, sorry, putting the Poisson distribution would be appropriate. However, in practice, we often still go for the implicit definition here because it's actually computationally easier to work with, um, in most cases, to work with this infinite dimensional implicit prior than it is to work with a explicit prior on the dimensionality. Okay, that was a great question though. Um, so we are being informative about the number of priors that we expect in our alpha. And actually we expect this to be roughly um, alpha log n uh, clusters um, in n observations based on this. So we'll talk a little later about how we can change those assumptions. Okay. Um, a more common way of thinking about samples from a Dirichlet process, but fundamentally the same as that urn idea, is to think about customers coming into a Chinese restaurant. So this is a metaphor that comes back to um, David Aldous, who was a probabilist who lived in San Francisco. Um, and I've not spent much time in San Francisco, but I hear they have very large Chinese restaurants. And these Chinese restaurants often have mirrored walls, um, so you walk in and think, wow, I'm in an infinitely large Chinese restaurant. And you're in this infinitely large Chinese restaurant and you need to decide where to sit. Um, so imagine we're in this scenario, Chinese restaurant, infinitely many tables. And the first customer is going to come in and they're going to sit at the first table. Okay? Without any loss of generality, we're calling it the first table because the first customer sat at it. The second customer is going to come in and they're going to choose where to sit based on how many people are sat at each table. So he's going to um, choose the table with the first customer with probability proportional to the number of customers at that table, in this case one, or he's going to pick a new probability, new customer, there, a new table with probability proportional to alpha. And then more customers are going to join. Right, so the third customer comes, he's going to sit at that first table with probability proportional to two and a new table with probability proportional to alpha. Next person comes in, he sits at a new table with probability proportional to alpha or the first table in this case with probability proportional to um, three and so on. And we can build up a system for how customers come in and sit at tables in this restaurant. And this restaurant analogy, um, I feel really helps us understand exactly what's going on in the Chinese restaurant process. So it allows us to see that we always have some probability of joining a new table, but it's going to decrease over time. And it also see, shows that we have this sort of rich gets richer behavior. People are going to tend to sit at popular tables. Right? If we've seen a thousand people at the first table and only 50 people at any other table, we're more likely to see that first table again. And this also gets to that idea that um, Dimitri brought up in the questions about having a implicit prior, right? Um, so before I sampled, I had no idea how many customers these seven people would sit on, um, how many customers they would sit on, how many tables they would sit at. Um, that would be a bit rude if they were sitting on other customers. 
um, it's a random number that is going to be upper bounded by n. And we can also show that this behaves um, similar to the earn schemes that we had before, right? Just as before, it is going to be exchangeable. The order doesn't matter. So we can use a lot of our inference tricks that have been developed for the Dirichlet distribution in this setting. The nice thing about working in this Chinese restaurant process setting is even though it's non-parametric, we have an infinite number of potential tables, we only need to consider the three that we've got here. Right? Um, and when we're considering new people, we really only have four options. They sit at one of these three tables or they sit at a new table. So we only need to represent four things. That's only a bit more than three. We don't need to think about this infinite dimensional object except for implicitly. Okay. Let's think about another way of thinking of the Dirichlet process, um, which is called the stick breaking construction. This is a way of visualizing um, how we get those underlying probabilities. So we could get those underlying probabilities by that infinite division step, but that's not really very practical because we don't have infinitely many times. So here I'm going to describe a sequential algorithmic way of getting that vector of probabilities. And again, this is going to help us see what's going on in our distribution. So imagine I start with a stick of unit length. So the unit length represents probability one. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to sample a beta random variable and I'm going to break the stick at that point. Right? So I'm going to sample a beta one alpha where alpha was my concentration parameter. Um, and I'm going to break off that proportion and call that my first atom. I've then got the rest of the stick left. I'm going to recurse on that and do exactly the same again. I'm going to sample a beta one alpha random variable. I'm going to break the stick at that proportion. That gives me my second atom. I'm then going to recurse again and again and again on the bits that are left. Right? So as I get um, an infinite series of atoms. And the beta random variable is always going to give me a number between zero and one, but never exactly zero and one. So I'll always have some remainder, right? So this process will never, never end. Um, it's kind of like um, that analog of the um, shooting the arrow at the tortoise, but it's actually true in this case. Okay, so um, let's think about this with another poll question. So I have this alternative way of generating a um, infinite dimensional probability vector where I generate it sequentially. I break off the first probability, I break off the second probability, I break off the third probability. Do I need to keep going forever? Okay. Do I need to generate all infinitely many in order to be able to work with it? Um, or can I just uh, stop? So let's consider, I want to sample 10 samples from a Dirichlet process mixture model. Right. Uh, am I going to be okay if I just sample the first um, 10 sticks and then use those probabilities to sample? Or am I going to need more? Or does it depend? That is not the question I thought it was. I'm sorry. Um, that is the next question. So there's a spoiler for the next question. Um, okay. Um, so the question that we actually have is, my apologies, um, is this going to give us a increasing or a decreasing set of probabilities? And when I say strictly decreasing, by that I mean the second stick will always be smaller than the first. 
And when I say it tends to decrease, that means it will on average be smaller than the first, but might not be. So um, it's interesting as we're seeing, the, as I'm seeing, watching the poll um, develop on my phone, I'm seeing a rich gets richer behavior. So uh, people are tending for the answers with the most answers. Um, so let's consider what we have so far, but please keep answering while I'm saying this. Um, so far, no one said it's increasing. So good. I think it's fairly clear that if we're going to keep going for infinite amount of times, so we're going to start getting to teeny tiny bits of the stick as we go. Okay, this is going to decrease. Um, but the question then is, is it strictly decreasing or not? Okay. Now, remember, the amount we break it at is a random variable. Right? It's going to be... Um, in between zero and one. Uh, so I could absolutely pick my first break to be at 0 0.01. Right? That is possible under the beta random variable. And that would mean my first atom is size 0 0.01. And then my second break, I could break it at 0.9. Right? In that case, my second atom is going to be almost 0.9. It's going to be 0 0.9 times 0.999. In that case, my second atom is going to be bigger than my first atom, right? Because of the randomness. But it's still going to give us a, on average, decreasing, right? We aren't gonna get a strict decrease because of the randomness of the breaks, but it's clear that we're going to, on average, get the big atoms first and then the smaller ones. So this is a lot more useful than uh, our infinite dividing because it means we can first generate the important ones, the ones that we're likely to see, and then generate the tail. And then this suggests an idea of when to stop, right? Because we haven't got infinite amounts of time to generate the full, whole vector. So maybe we don't need to. If we're generating these big probabilities first, maybe we can just generate a few and be done. So let's say, and here's the question that I thought I was asking, but now we're a little more prepared because we've thought about stick breaking a little more. Uh, let's say I want to sample 10 cluster assignments and I'm going to do this by first generating the probabilities and then sampling my assignments based on those probabilities. If I want to sample um, 10 cluster assignments, will I always be okay if I've sampled 10 breaks, will that always be sufficient? Will it never be sufficient? Or will it depend? Okay, so looking at the responses so far, um, the majority are saying, yes, that will always be enough. So let's think about this. We know that the maximum number of clusters that we see is going to be 10, right? Because we've only got 10 points. But remember, we're not generating these necessarily in um, the size order. Right? So it's entirely possible that if we generated the first, if we generated um, the entire infinite sequence and then we sampled the first one, it comes from component 20, right? Um, so sort of to see that as the case, we could um, sample the first break at 0.01, the second break at 0.01, the third break at 0.01, you know, very unlikely, but it could happen. And then the 11th break at 0.99, right? Then the most popular cluster is going to be that 11th cluster. So, while we are going to only have at most 10 clusters, they're not necessarily going to correspond to the first 10 components. Which sounds disappointing, maybe we still need to do the infinite sequence. But in practice, it's not going to be that big a deal. Um, so 
on average, we've got the bigger components first. So we can start off by um, generating the first few components and then adding more on the fly if we need them. So let's say we have the first three components and they have probabilities uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. We know with probability 0.7, we're in one of the tails that we haven't got yet, right? So if we sample a, a uniform random variable and end up in the 0.7 probability, then we know we need to add some more components. And we can actually do this in a really nice algorithmic way um, that kind of tells us when to stop. So instead of sampling my probability vector, I can treat this as a sequ sequential decision. So I know the probability of the first cluster is that first break size BK. So um, I sample that and that gives me the probability of being the first one. Let's say um, I want to sample. I can then flip a coin with that probability. That tells me if I'm in the first cluster or not. If no, I move on to the second. The probability of being in the second cluster, given I'm not in the first cluster, is then B2. It's not the size of the stick, it's the size of the break that I made after that, right? Because I've already turned down the first stick. So I can flip a coin with probability B2. And that's then going to be the probability of being in the second cluster. And I can keep going down the line until I get a yes. And I know um, that could take arbitrarily long, but because we've got um, this size ordered behavior, it's probably not going to take that long. So it gives us a nice sort of algorithmic stopping rule for how much we need to generate. And I know that, um, that's, that that's going to be a finite number. Okay, so we've spent a lot of time today talking about different representations, both the Dirichlet distribution and the Dirichlet process. And you might be thinking, well, couldn't you just have given us one at the beginning and then we can move on to stuff? And I could have done. Um, and maybe going forwards, if you use this again, you're gonna pick your favorite and run with it. But the reason why I went with so many different ways of having the infinite Dirichlet distribution, of having the urn scheme, the restaurant scheme, the stick breaking, is because each of these help us understand what's going on in a slightly different way. Right? It was really easy to see that rich gets richer behavior in the Chinese restaurant process. And it's really easy to kind of picture how the probabilities look in the stick breaking process. Um, if you get into this, these also suggest different ways of doing inference. Like I said, I'm not going to super get into the inference now, though I will discuss on Friday a little bit about inference tools. But I feel more importantly, it teaches you ways of modifying them. So this then gets back to Dimitri's question about um, the implicit assumptions that we've made. We've come up with a model that has an implicit distribution over the number of components, um, and that we can describe in a number of ways. Each of these ways suggests a method for modifying our distribution. Um, so we had our Chinese restaurant process and we picked tables proportional to how many people were sat at, the, sat at that table. What if instead we decided that customers could leave after a certain amount of time? Um, that would make us less likely to sit at that table. So now we'll have something that evolves over time, right? Rich tables get richer, but also old tables get forgotten. And that's a valid modification. This is something known as the distance dependent Chinese restaurant process. And you can use that to do time dependent clustering. And once you know these representations, that's a natural thing to ask once you're starting to think about restaurants. Or what if we took the stick breaking procedure and said, instead of having the same beta distribution for each break, we have that distribution depend on 
how many sticks we've seen so far. And again, that's the thing that people do. So if instead of breaking at a beta one alpha, we instead um, increase that second parameter as we go through the stick breaking procedure, uh, we're going to change um, the sizes of our breaks, right? The size that we're breaking off is going to decrease each time. And that's going to give us more low occupancy clusters. And that's something known as the Pitt manure process. And it actually is a really good match for a lot of things that we see in data where we have a lot of low probability things. So it's a really good match for language where we tend to follow a zip distribution. Uh, so we'll talk about some of these modifications and some applications um, on Friday. Now that we've understood the basic fundamentals of what's going on, um, I think I'm really uh, rushing up against time. I just saw Sushi join the call, so uh, <laughs> I imagine she wants to tell you about causal inference. Um, so, so, uh, but we're actually so very well on time, so it's good that uh, you can wrap up here, Shinai. I'm gonna yeah, this, this was exactly where I planned on wrapping up. I just, I'd hoped to be questions, but I hadn't banked on the internet dying. <laughs> Okay, so on Wednesday, uh, we talked a little about um, constructing basic non-parametric priors. Uh, we spent a lot of time talking about parametric distributions, specifically the Dirichlet distribution. And then we spent a bunch of time extending that to the infinite dimensional case. And that gave us the potential to uh, create models where we don't have a fixed dimensionality. Right. And that was useful for cases where we either don't know the appropriate dimensionality, and we're kind of putting an implicit prior on it, or where we think that the dimensionality is going to grow as we saw more data. Now, on Monday, we kind of used very simplistic examples. Everything was a mixture of Gaussians. Um, and that was kind of so that we could understand what was actually going on in the prior. Now, today, I want to talk a little about how we can actually use these models, um, use these distributions to construct more complicated models. So I'm going to give uh, two examples today, uh, one surrounding modeling documents and one surrounding modeling networks. Now, today, I'm not going to use the Slido um, because I sometimes missed questions last time jumping across. Uh, but I'm going to ask things and ask you to type in the chat, which I can see through the same window. Uh, so please do that. And also, please, if you have any questions, um, use that chat. And either I will notice it or Rodrigo will notice it and tell me that I'm ignoring you. I will. <laughs> and hopefully you'll also keep an eye on me if I'm terrible on time, <laughs> etc. <cetera. laughs> Excellent. Um, so how many of you have uh, either come across um, or worked with topic models? So things such as latent Dirichlet allocation uh, for capturing um, topic behavior in documents. Okay, so we've got some people um, saying they have come across them, maybe not worked with them. Um, one person's read the Wikipedia article, which is great. Um, that is my usual resource for um, distributions and things. Um, so basically what a topic model does, it's a, a way of describing documents in terms of topics. So we're going to assume in the standard um, situation that we have K topics that we're going to use uh, to represent our documents. Now, these aren't predefined topics. Uh, they're things that we're going to infer from the data. And so we're going to be Bayesian about this. So we're going to put a prior distribution on our topic. Now, in this context, a topic is just a distribution over words. 
So we might have a topic that puts high probability on the words football and basketball, and then that would kind of semantically be a topic about sport. And as a distribution over words, we're going to put a Dirichlet distribution on it. Right? That's our standard distribution for when we want a vector of probabilities. And then each document, and then, okay, so based on what we saw on Wednesday, we were looking at mixture models. So if we were going to do a mixture model of topics, we would put a distribution over the topics. We have k topics, so that's going to be pi, which is k-dimensional. And then for each document, we would pick a topic according to that distribution. And then we would assume that the words were generated by sampling words from that corresponding topic. Right. And this is a perfectly good mixture model for documents. And it's not a bad uh, distribution or model for short documents such as tweets. But once we get into articles and longer documents, this isn't going to be flexible enough. Right. So sure, there might be some articles that are purely about sport, uh, but we're also going to have documents that are about um, the uh, revenue that a sport brings in for a university. Right? That article isn't just about sport, it's about sport, it's about money, it's about schools. Right? So we're going to want to uh, have something more flexible that rather than associating a document with a single topic, like we would in a mixture model, we have a single component, we're going to associate it with a whole slew of topics. Um, and this is something that's called an admixture model. And the most common example of this is latent Dirichlet allocation. So here, instead of having a single topic, as we did in the mixture model, each document has its own distribution over uh, topics. Right? And then each word in that distribution is going to be associated with a single topic, where those topics are distributed according to that document-specific distribution. So kind of describing this algorithmically, how we would generate this. Um, for each document, we're going to independently sample a distribution over a shared set of K topics. And then for each word in that document, we're going to sample a topic from that document specific distribution. And then once we've got that topic, we're going to look at the corresponding um, distribution over words, and we're going to sample a word from that topic. So if you've um, seen plate notation before, this is another way of representing that. So here we have a um, box with K in and beta inside that. That shows that we have K separate distributions over words, beta 1 through beta K, all with shared hyperparameters eta. And then we have M documents, that's this top box. Each of those have a separate uh, distribution theta over topics. And then for each word in that document, that's this internal box, uh, we're going to sample a topic from that document specific distribution. Then we're going to look at the corresponding beta and sample a word um, from that beta. And that gives us our observations for the documents, like up to some ordering. So X here shaded is what we see. And then we're going to use Bayesian inference to infer uh, what the latent parameters are or the distributions over those latent parameters. And actually, this is um, something where we will often use variational Bayes, which I know we've, uh, I know Tamara has talked about a little um, earlier on in this summer school. And what happens when we infer this, because we have these shared topics that are shared across the document, um, we end up learning sort of semantically interpretable topics, because right? it's sharing information across the documents um, and it's putting words that uh, often appear together into the same topics. So this is a picture that I've shamelessly stolen from the original latent Dirichlet allocation paper. And this demonstrates uh, some of these topics that we find in a document. 
So what the four columns at the top here are, those are the highest probability words in four of the topics that we found. Okay, so all of these topics are actually a vector um, of length, whatever our dictionary length is, but here we've got um, the dozen or so highest probability topics. And we see in the left, left hand side one that it's got a lot of words to do with the arts. So films, shows, plays, musicals. Um, and uh, that's been labeled arts, but that's a post hoc label, right? Um, someone, uh, probably Dave Bly, has looked at this topic and has decided to call it the arts topic. Um, I see there's a question which I'm going to come to in a second. And then on the right, we've got topics to do with education, right? School, students, teachers, etc. So that one's been post hoc labeled the education topic. So someone has asked, um, that, uh, and it's already been answered, but I'll mention it anyway, because I know some people are watching on YouTube and can't see the chat. Um, so each topic here contains every single word in the dictionary. It's just going to have high probabilities on some and low probabilities on others. So, for example, um, the word school is going to still be in this vector of probabilities for the arts. It's just going to have really small probability. And we can have things um, that have reasonably high probabilities in multiple, um, in multiple topics. Right? So I'm not sure if there actually is any overlap in uh, what we're seeing in these things, but I'd imagine, for example, um, the topics associated with children and families will have some words that have um, high overlap with education. Right? And this makes sense because words can mean different things in different contexts. Right? If I'm talking about children in an article about uh, family dynamics, um, that's clearly in the context of a family, whereas if I'm talking about children as a synonym for pupils in a school, that's clearly in an educational context. And then here we have a document where um, we have uh, lab where we've labeled uh, the words with their most probable topic. Right? And so here we see that that document is a mixture of these um, four topics. Uh, some words belong to other topics and haven't been colored. Um, so we have words such as New York Philharmonic and performing that are associated with the arts and words such as um, provide and $400,000 and grants associated with budgets. And so um, this is a way of understanding um, in a very like interpretable way what's going on in these documents um, and what a document is about. Now, like all of the models that we saw at the beginning of last time, latent Dirichlet allocation is making a number of dimensionality assumptions. So we have two Dirichlet or two collections of probability vectors. We have the distributions over words, which is a topic. And we have the distribution over topics for each document. And both of those we've had to choose a size, right? The size for the topic and the number of topics. And then the question becomes, how do we choose them? I would argue for the distribution over words as a topic, we probably got a good guess. Right? I can look at the size of the, uh, if I'm working in English, English dictionary or whatever language I'm working in, and that can be my V. Right? Or I can just consider, say, the top thousand, ten thousand words and just ignore words that fall outside of that. I could relax this, this assumption. I know that in practice languages evolve and we add new words, but for now I'm going to assume that it's reasonable to assume the set of words that we use for documents is fixed. But it's harder to pick the number of topics. Right? We can't just look at a dictionary. We maybe have a fixed number of words, but there are effectively boundless ways we can combine those 
And it seems artificial to put a limit on the number of topics that we can get with those words. So this seems a really good candidate for the Dirichlet process. It, we don't know how many topics there are going to be. And it seems unreasonable to assume that in some finite corpus of documents, we've seen all possible topics of discussion. Okay, so let's go back. It's been a couple of days. Um, so let's think about uh, how we sampled from the Dirichlet process and what that means and how we can use that in our current context. So we started off by sampling some infinite vector of probabilities. We had a number of ways of doing that. We could either think of the infinite limit of a finite Dirichlet, we could use our stick breaking process, or we could do this implicitly using the Chinese restaurant process or one of those urn schemes. Whatever way, we end up with a set of cluster probabilities. And then for each of those cluster probabilities, we associated, sorry, we sampled an associated cluster parameter from some distribution over parameters. Now, on Wednesday, we assumed that this distribution over parameters was a distribution over means and variances, or means and covariances. Um, but here, we're going to let it be a distribution over topics, because okay? we want each mixture component to be a topic. But that's fine. H can be whatever we want. So we can choose it to be a Dirichlet distribution. So for each component, we're going to sample a probability vector according to a Dirichlet distribution. And that's going to give us a infinite mixture of topics. Okay? Rather than each component being a Gaussian, each component now is a distribution over words or a topic. So now we're like almost the way there, right? We've built an infinite mixture over topics. Uh, but we actually had something more sophisticated than just a mixture over topics in LDA. We had this admixture or this hierarchical construction. Rather than having uh, one mixture of one infinite or finite in that case distribution over topics, each document had its own distribution over topics. So how do we do that? Well, the obvious thing to think is, let's do the same as we did in LDA. Let's have a Dirichlet process for each document. Then we have an infinite mixture of topics for each document. But this runs into a subtle problem that we're need, going to need to get around that didn't happen in that finite case. So let's consider two samples from the Dirichlet process. In each case, we have sampled our infinite dimensional probability vector. And for each of those components, we have sampled a distribution over words from that Dirichlet. Now, the Dirichlet distribution is a continuous distribution, much like the Gaussian. So, Let's maybe think in terms of the Gaussian because we're probably more comfortable with that. Uh, if I have two samples from a Gaussian, what's the probability they're going to be exactly the same? So, uh, excellent, we've got one, one person said uh, zero, and that's exactly right. If you have a continuous distribution, you're never going to get a repeat, right? Even if you sample infinitely many times from a Gaussian distribution, you are not going to get any repeats. Okay. They might round to the same number if we just look at a finite number of decimal places, but they're not going to be exactly on top of each other. And that's true of the Dirichlet, uh, sorry, of the Dirichlet distribution as well, which we're using as our base measure now. Um, so our two distributions over topics won't have any topics in common, right? Every component is going to not exist in the other. And that's a problem because the reason why the 
um, latent Dirichlet allocation topic model worked was because we had these shared topics. We can share um, statistical information across documents and that allows us to infer what the topics are. If a topic in my document can never appear in anyone else's document, I can't really learn much about what that document, what that topic is, right? I have no reason to associate some words with some topics and some words with others. Now, this wasn't a problem in LDA because we had specifically had K topics and we were assigning probabilities to those specific K. Right? It's only a problem here because we're sampling those topics um, from some distribution. So how can we get around this? Well, the problem was that our base measure was continuous. That's why we um, didn't get repeats. But if we have a discrete base measure, which is totally fine, we can have a discrete probability distribution, then we're going to start getting repeats. So here I've got a schematic of a really simple discrete base measure. It's just got six uh, probability atoms with equal probability. And I'm going to do exactly what I did before with the Dirichlet process. I'm going to sample some uh, infinite sequence of uh, probabilities. And then for each of them, I'm going to pick a location according to this discrete base measure. So let's say um, I first pick this sample. Sorry, my distribution changed there. That was not intentional. Um, and I'm going to assign that to my first component with probability one sixth. I then pick another, another sample. I'm going to now assign that to that sixth component. Now I pick another sample and I've assigned that back to the first component again. So as I keep sampling these things, it's going to repeatedly build up probabilities onto those six points that we had. Now, if I did this again with a different Dirichlet process, I'd end up with a different final six dimensional probability vector, but the probabilities would be at the same points on the line. Now, in our case, we can't have the probabilities at fixed points on the line because that those correspond to fixed topics and we don't know our topics in advance. Okay. But that's okay. Instead of having our discrete distribution at fixed locations, we can have them at random locations. But it's also not going to work if we have six, right? Because the whole point of using a Dirichlet process is that we wanted an unbounded number of topics. So how can we have a base measure that's discrete, has random locations, but has an infinite number of probabilities? Well, we've already seen this. We've been spending all of Wednesday constructing infinite discrete um, probability measures um, on some space. So instead of using a six dimensional probability vector, we can use a infinite dimensional probability vector where each atom is associated with a random topic. And this is what's called a hierarchical Dirichlet process. We have one Dirichlet process at the top, which is picking out an infinite sequence of topics. And that's going to define all of the topics that can be used by any document. There's infinitely many of them, um, but they are countable, right? They are at specific locations. And then for each document, we're going to sample a document-specific Dirichlet process, but we're going to use that high-level global Dirichlet process, G0, as a base measure. And this means that our document-specific um, Dirichlet process will have its topics in the same place as the top level. It's also going to tend on average to have uh, large topics, high probability topics, at the same places as that base measure had high probability topics. Right? Because 
Um, each time we have a uh, break in our stick and we're sampling a location, we're more likely to obtain these high probability um, uh, topics than the low probability ones. So now we have something that we can work with. Um, if we repeat this, we're going to get a sequence, G1, G2, I only did G2, but you can imagine it going on as large as you want, of distributions over topics where the topics are all in common. Right? They're all shared between um, each of the documents because of this top level Dirichlet process. And then we can generate our documents exactly as we did for LDA. So um, each of these infinitely many topics is associated with a distribution over words. Each document is associated with a distribution over topics, infinite dimensional. And then we're going to do exactly the same as we did before. We're going to sample um, topics according to that um, local Dirichlet process. Then we're going to look at that topic specific beta and we're going to sample the words. And then we're going to crank our inference engine so that we can infer what those topics are and what those distributions over topics are. Now, again, each document is only going to have as many occupied topics, right? We're only going to see ZIs associated with a finite number of topics, right? Because we have a finite number of words in the document and each word is only associated with one topic. Um, so we've, I've been talking about this in terms of that sort of stick breaking representation where we see the whole probability distribution. But last time we looked at other representations of the Dirichlet distribution that often gave us a better intuition. And I really like the Chinese restaurant process because that allows you to get a feel for what's going on in these mixtures, right? You can see how we have a finite number of topics, but it's going to grow. You can see how you have this rich gets richer property. Right, so as a reminder for that, we had this infinitely large restaurant, customers come in um, and they sit at tables. Um, first one sits at the first table and then subsequent customers sit at tables with probability proportional to how many people are at that table. And then once we've got our tables, each table is going to sample a dish a parameter in other words. And those are going to be sampled IID from some distribution over parameters. Right. So tying this back to our stick breaking, um, each table kind of corresponds to a stick and the color of that table corresponds to the location of that stick. Now we can extend this um, restaurant analogy to a hierarchy of restaurants. And what is a hierarchy of restaurants? Well, that's a franchise of restaurants. So that's what we're going to be thinking about. We're going to be thinking about a franchise of restaurants, um, something like a McDonald's where each McDonald's has infinitely many tables. Right? So all of these restaurants are in different locations, but they have a shared menu. So here, each document is going to be associated with a single restaurant in this franchise. And each word in that document is going to be a customer sat at a table. And we're going to have um, the dishes correspond to topics. And we're going to have the dishes be shared across the franchise of our restaurant. So let's take a look at how this works. We have our first restaurant, um, which is our first document, and the customers have picked tables according to a Chinese restaurant process. And then rather than sampling a dish from that continuous distribution, they're gonna ask their waiter to pick them a dish. 
And the waiter is going to consider all dishes that have ever been served in that franchise. And then he's going to pick a dish with probability proportional to how many times that dish has been served. Right? So how many tables in the entire franchise have chosen that dish. Or he's going to pick a new um, dish with probability uh, proportional to some constant um, gamma. This is the first table, so he's going to get a new dish. Then the second dish is either going, sorry, the second table, he's either going to give that um, first dish with probability proportional to one, because one table has had that dish, or a new dish with probability proportional to gamma. So let's say he picks a new dish. Then the third table asks him, what should I eat? They get assigned a red dish, that first dish, with probability proportional to one, one table has had a blue di a red dish, a blue dish with probability proportional to one, and a new dish with probability proportional to gamma. Right? So let's say in that case we pick the red dish again. So we have two Chinese restaurant processes going on here, one determining where the customers sit, and one determining what dish they get. Okay, let's move to the second restaurant. Here, the customers don't know where people are sat at the other restaurant. They're going to sit down at a Chinese restaurant process with probability um, independent of the first restaurant. So they're only considering how many people are sat at each table. They're then going to ask their waiter to pick a dish. Now this waiter knows what has been served at the first table. So he's going to pick a red dish now with probability proportional to two, which is the number of red dishes we've had. A blue dish with probability proportional to one, or a new dish with probability proportional to gamma. Um, okay, so someone's asked tables are words in this analogy. So um, tables are actually topics in this analogy. Uh, so if we carry the analogy through to the final um, decision, we could imagine that each customer at a table picks a document, uh, picks a word from that topic. Um, at that point, the, the um, analogy gets a little convoluted. Um, so the colors of the tables are the topics. Okay, so let's say this, this waiter gives a red dish for the first one. And then for the second one, it's going to take a red dish with probability proportional to three, a blue dish with probability proportional to one, a new dish with probability proportional to gamma. Let's say he picks a new dish. Okay. So here you can kind of get a feel for the sort of behavior in a corpus of documents. As we're building up a document, we're going to tend to pick topics that we've seen before in that document. Um, because we're going to tend to have words sit at tables that have already appeared, right? So they get the same word. Or we're going to pick a topic that has been popular in the entire corpus. Right? So we get these two levels of clustering. We tend to have globally popular topics, but once we've picked a couple of topics, we're going to tend to see those repeated. Right? And that kind of fits how, say, topics in articles or books work. Right? There are a number of things that people tend to write articles about. Sport, music, education, money. Um, but once you've started a document, you tend to keep using the same topics again and again. So what's the advantage of this? over just using a uh, finite topic model. Right? So this is a um, couple of figures from the paper that first introduced this hierarchical construction. And on the left, um, what they've done is look at, well, what if we just picked um, different values of uh, K to pick our topic model. And here we're plotting the perplexity versus K in that finite model. Right? So perplexity 
um, is one of those um, lower is good type metrics. Uh, I have accidentally uh, chopped off the first digit in copying and pasting this, um, but hopefully that sort of makes sense. So we can see uh, 10 topics, too few. We're not getting our optimal performance. 20 topics, too few. We're not getting our optimal performance. Um, and then we have a low point between like 50 and 80. And then after that, it starts getting worse again. Right? So this suggests that the right number of topics for this corpus of documents is in the 50 to 80 point. And if we add more beyond that, then we're going to start overfitting. We're not overfitting by that much, um, but it's still overfitting a little. So we could do cross-validation on the number K right, and learn all of these separate models. But it's a lot easier to just learn one model that infers that value of K. And here we see that sort of empirical distribution over the number of topics that we get out of using this hierarchical Dirichlet model. And we see it corresponds nicely with the ranges of K for LDA where we got good performance. So this is kind of a like, one-stop shop for doing that uh, dimensionality selection. And it also has the nice property that you can't kind of see in this simple figure that it will behave in a consistent way if our data set grows in future. Right? This is not saying that there are um, between 61 and 73 topics and there forever will be. And if we see 1,000, 2,000, 100,000 more documents, there will still be between 61 and 73 um, topics. This is saying there is an unbounded number of topics, but in this finite corpus, this is roughly how many we've seen. And this idea of constructing distributions into hierarchies is kind of fundamental to, I wanna say all of, definitely all of non-parametric Bayesian inference, but also really all of Bayesian inference, right? That's how um, we draw statistical strength from different data sets and how we can kind of effectively use one data set almost as a prior for another data set. So I'm gonna take this idea of hierarchies and I'm going to shift to a different application. Uh, so this is something that I work on a lot um, so I'm being selfish now and talking about the things that I care about. Um, oh, but I just see that um, if we choose bad priors, so that the HDP mixture finds too little or too many topics in expectation, would the HDP um, also perform worse? So that's a good question. We could um, almost, like we could pick a value of alpha that is very, that is very, um, very small, um, in which case it would overwhelm and encourage there to be too few topics. In practice though, alpha is only fairly weakly informative of the number of topics. So it's informative a priori, and we tend to have a priori increase with the number of topics, but in practice, um, it very quickly kind of gets overwhelmed by the amount of data. And this is a reason why you'll sometimes see uh, Bayesian non-parametric uh, work being presented at objective Bayes uh, conferences. Right? It's an infinite dimensional prior, but it's fairly weakly informative. Now, Personally, I tend to go on the option of like, that's, that's not weak enough. Um, so what I'll typically do is put a uh, prior over that parameter alpha, right? So pass the buck one step further um, and put, that, put a vague, typically gamma prior uh, so that I'm not being too uh, didactic about what I expect it to be. And honestly, that's kind of a, like, we're talking about Bayesian non-parametrics. But that's a valid criticism of Bayesian methods in general. 
right? If we, so the benefit of Bayesian methods is we can pick our prior and um, imbue our model with our prior knowledge. But the, the hidden bad side of that is we can abuse that by putting in a really terrible prior and a really strong terrible prior and then um, that will overwhelm our data. Right? So um, I think the key takeaway here is to be responsible, to think about um, what, where you want to concentrate your data and to do things like, I often like to do things like, if I try a range of alphas, does it significantly change things? Okay. Um, another question, having priors over priors, is this not, is this then not equivalent to just picking another distribution at the lowest level? Uh, why do we need a hierarchy? Um, okay, so there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to split this into two questions. One, why have priors over priors? At some point, you have to stop having priors, right? <laughs> like, we can't have um, priors over priors over priors. Um, and the practical answer is... Uh, keep putting priors until, um, so the re so, okay, let, let me come to this again. The reason I put priors over say alpha in my models is typically because I don't have a good idea what alpha should be, right? I want to be non-informative. If I wanted to be informative, I would make a different choice. Um, and at some point, the effect of that prior is so weak that it doesn't make any difference. So practically, at some point, if I change that top level prior, it's not going to make any practical difference in effect because the effect it has is so weak. Um, so, you know, in, you could actually test that assumption. In practice, kind of, you get a feel for at what point that's going to be true. Um, then there's the question of why do we need a hierarchy? Um, so there's a difference here between the hierarchy of putting a prior on our prior, which is hierarchical, right? We've got a prior on alpha and then that um, gives us our top level Dirichlet and so on. And we could put a prior on that prior on that prior and then that's a hierarchy. Um, but it's not this sort of spreading hierarchy that we have here. So when I talk about hierarchies in Bayesian inference, um, I talk about this sort of spreading effect, right? Where here we have a global um, distribution and then that couples multiple sp um, document specific distributions, right? And that, um, there the role of that coupling distribution is less it's like put in our prior knowledge it is to provide a link between these separate distributions, right? So that we can capture um, the commonality um, between them and the variation across them. But those are both great questions. Um, and I'm not sure I've caught the um, everything in George's question, because there's a lot to unpack there. Um, but if not, you know, we've got time to discuss at the end. So maybe let's come back to that uh, at that point because I really want to talk about networks, because you guys, I really like networks. Um, so, and we can definitely come back to that because, you know, that's really important, um, how we specify a prize. So why do we want to model networks? Well, there's a number of reasons. Right? Networks are everywhere. Right? We have social networks, we have uh, networks of communication, such as internet, we have road networks, we have biological networks, um, we have molecular molecules, which we represent as networks. And there's all sorts of things we can do with this, right? Maybe we have a social network and we want to predict what happens next, right? We want to predict who's going to interact with who. We want to predict who a person just joining Twitter is going to follow and so on. We might not care about prediction. We want to understand much like 
LDA, latent directional allocation, wasn't really about predicting words, it was about understanding the structure in documents. And there might be things that we want to do on top of that understanding. Right? We might want to understand um, how communities interact, and we might want to understand the characteristics of a bad actor in a network. Um, and we might also have the situation where we don't observe our network um, exactly, right? We want to infer a latent network. So this is kind of true in Twitter. Um, we see who tweets after who, but we don't really, that's only a noisy representation of a true social network. This is often true in biological interactions. We only see, we only uh, glimpse at the network through um, physical observations, uh, chemicals that are released and so on. Um, so I'm going to talk about some work that uh, I and others have done in this area. So I'm going to focus on um, human generated networks because I know nothing about biology. Uh, so, but I do know about Facebook and Twitter, sadly. Um, don't know what that says about me. So we're going to focus on social networks, email networks, things like that. Now, these networks have a number of properties that we might want to model. So they grow over time, right? We have both new edges appear, um, new connections between people who weren't previously connected, but we also have new nodes appear. We have people joining uh, Twitter, people joining an email network. They tend to be sparse. So technically sparse in a network means um, as the network grows, the number of actual edges grows slowly relative to the number of potential edges. So the number of potential edges are basically the number of nodes squared, right? If everyone knew everyone, um, then the number of edges would be quadratic in the number of nodes. But in practice, people only tend to know a fairly small subset of the network that is kind of invariant of the network size. Right? If um, an entire new country joined Facebook tomorrow, it would probably have zero effect on the size of my social network. And then the other thing is I have a social network, right? Networks have clustering structure. I am not following people randomly on Twitter. I'm following people who tweet about um, statistics and machine learning. And they have a rich get richer property. Right? Um, I tend to follow people on Twitter who have a lot of followers. Right? Everyone tends to follow um, like Beyonce on Twitter, for example. And they evolve over time. Who is popular changes. Um, who is interacting with who changes over time. So those are a lot of things to model. And we're going to try and get at some ways that we can use Bayesian nonparametrics to capture some of this sort of behavior. So before we do that, let's think about the simplest networks that we can get, right? Because it's always good to start with the basics and then make them more complicated. And this is one of the sort of two fundamental uh, network models. Um, it's one of the two Erdos-Renyi models. It's called the GMN model. And this is a model where we assume that we have N nodes and we're going to have m edges. And we're going to just sample them uniformly without replacement. Right? And this is a model for an undirected graph. So we're effectively sampling um, m entries from the upper triangle of the potential adjacency matrix. Right? So on the left, we have an adjacency matrix sampled, where basically we have picked a random m edges. And then we've got a network representation on the right. So this has the advantage that it's simple, but it clearly does not look like a social network. Right? It doesn't have any sort of structure, um, which makes sense because we've picked the edges entirely at random. And it also can't grow in a reasonable manner, right? We have those um, N nodes predefined. And if we suddenly add extra nodes, then those original M edges are no longer sampled uniformly without replacement. They're biased towards the original nodes. But despite 
create this, it has some properties that is going to make it a good building block. So let's drill down into what's going on in this Erdos Reni model. We're modeling our network as a sequence of edges or links. And these edges are sampled IID without replacement um, from the set of possible links. Okay, so here um, I can represent my adjacency matrix in terms of this sequence of edges, which exactly defines my network. And I'm going to modify this a little to give a directed network because I feel directed networks are more interesting. Right? But you can easily see how you could extend this to be directed. Right? Instead of sampling a sequence of undirected edges, we just sample a sequence of directed edges. So here, um, the thick end of these links indicates the direction. So we've got an edge from um, one to two, an edge from two to three, but then later on, we've also got an edge from three to two. Now, how can we go from here? So we generated this sequence by sampling without replacement, right? So we never got repeats. But in statistics, it's a lot harder to sample without replacement, right, than to just sample IID samples. So let's just assume we're going to sample IID samples. This means we're going to have repeats. But maybe that's fine. Right? So if we have, for example, a um, network of emails, we do have repeats of edges. Right? Uh, Rodrigo has emailed me several times to ask whether <laughs> I am ready for the network and I've replied to him. Um, so we do have repeats. So that's okay. We're going beyond binary networks into integer valued networks. So now we're going to sample without replacement. And so here we've seen, for example, the edge between three and four twice, the edge between two and five twice. Now, how do we get this into a network which can grow? Right? We've explicitly assumed that we're sampling now with replacement from a finite number of potential edges because we have a finite number of potential nodes. But in, we want to be able to grow this network, um, so we want both n and m to be able to grow. Growing m is easy, we can just sample more edges, right? But we want to make n be able to grow in a principled way. Easiest way of doing this is instead of have a finite number of nodes n, we're going to have an infinite number of nodes. You might have guessed this. This has been uh, my key take home from everything so far. So instead of sampling from a uniform distribution over n nodes, I'm going to sample from a infinite distribution over infinitely many nodes. Okay. So I have some probability distribution over infinitely many nodes. I'm going to use the Dirichlet process because we know that. And I'm going to sample um, sequences of what I'm going to call sender and recipients, right? because I'm thinking in terms of emails, um, IID from this uh, network, from this distribution. Right? So now I have something that I can sample as many edges as I want. And I expect the number of nodes, right? those are the senders and recipients, to grow over time. Okay, how can we improve on this? Well, here, I've called these senders and recipients, but they're IID, right? There's nothing really distinguishing someone as being a sender or someone as being a recipient. But I'm sorry, Rodrigo, Rodrigo has sent me a lot more emails than I've sent him because I am terrible at answering emails. Um, so we don't have, <laughs> I'm going to work on it, but we don't have a symmetric email relationship in the last uh, few weeks, right? Um, I am much more likely to be a recipient of an email in this setting. 
So I'm going to have two different distributions. Right? I'm going to have one distribution for senders and one distribution for recipients. And I'm going to make those Dirichlet processes again so that we have infinitely many senders and infinitely many recipients. But I do sometimes email Rodrigo back. <laughs> I am not that terrible. Uh, so I want them to have shared support, right? I don't want the set of senders to be entirely disjoint from the set of recipients. Much like I didn't want the set of topics in one document to be entirely disjoint from the set of documents, the set of topics in another document. So I'm going to do exactly the same thing as I did to ensure the topics were the same. I'm going to hierarchically couple these two distributions in a hierarchical Dirichlet process. I'm going to have one global distribution over nodes, uh, vertices, and then I'm going to sample a distribution over senders using that global distribution as the base measure and a distribution over recipients using that same distribution as the base measure. So now I'm going to have two infinite dimensional distributions where they have the same support, right? The nodes both have finite probability, every node has finite probability, even if it's vanishingly small, as a sender and a recipient. Okay, so what does this look like? So on the left here, I have uh, drawn, I've sampled from this distribution and I have generated an adjacency matrix. And then on the right, I plotted that as a graph. So here you can see there is that asymmetry, right? This is not a symmetric ma ma matrix. Um, there is a difference between behavior as a sender and behavior as a recipient. And by construction, we have an unbounded number of nodes. So if I keep drawing this, I will get increasingly many edges and increasingly many nodes. And we also get that rich gets richer. We follow the popular people, right? Because the Dirichlet process has that rich gets richer. <coughs> Sorry. But it still doesn't really look like Twitter or Facebook or an email network. It doesn't really have any structure except some people are likely to send emails a lot and some people are likely to receive emails a lot. In real networks, we have clustering, we have peaks, we have in-groups, people who communicate with each other. Uh, we don't have just this rich gets richer prefer preferential attachment behavior. So what we're going to do is add yet more hierarchy here. Instead of having just one of these, what I call a Dirichlet network distribution, I'm going to have a mixture of Dirichlet network distributions. So I'm going to have every edge belong to one distribution. And then that distribution, that cluster, has its own cluster specific distribution over senders and recipients. Um, so Maybe the uh, Smile Summer School cluster has a high probability of Rodrigo being a sender and me being a recipient. Uh, but the um, Oscars cluster does not have a high probability of either of us being a sender or a recipient. But, you know, maybe Rodrigo has a, uh, sorry that I'm using you as my example <laughs> all the time. I've been emailing you a lot lately. Um, he may well be a Hollywood star and I just don't know it. So maybe he can belong to multiple clusters. So we want these clusters to have overlapping support. Um, and again, we're going to do that using a hierarchical construction. Okay. So each node can have high probability under multiple clusters. Just like in the topic model, a word could have high probability in multiple clusters. Um, each email, if we're talking about emails, is going to belong to a single cluster and it's going to pick from people who are high probability in that cluster. Right? And again, within each cluster, it's going to be asymmetric. All right, so let's take a look 
taking a breath because I'm going to go for some math, um, through what this looks like mathematically. So I'm going to have a uh, distribution over the clusters. And because why not? Because I don't know how many clusters there are. I'm going to put a Dirichlet process on that. I'm going to allow there to be infinitely many uh, modalities of communication. And I'm also going to sample H, which, as before, is my global distribution over nodes, in this case, over people who might send or receive an email. And then for each of my infinitely many clusters that are in D, I'm going to sample a distribution for senders uh, with base measure H, so it's those same people, and distribution over recipients. Um, so these are AK and BK. So each cluster has uh, two distributions, one for sender and recipient, and all of those distributions have shared support because of this hierarchy. And then we're going to build up a, a network um, exactly as I described. I'm going to pick a cluster from this infinite set of clusters. I'm then going to look at the sender distribution for that cluster. I'm going to pick a sender. Then I'm going to look at the receiver, recipient um, distribution for that cluster, and I'm going to pick a recipient. And I can build up a um, distribution over uh, edges in that way, and that defines a distribution over networks. And so here I've generated a sample from that, and it's starting to have a little more uh, clustering structure than we saw in the previous adjacency matrix. Right? We're starting to have some clumps happen. And the size of these clumps are, and the behavior of these clumps are controlled by those parameters in our model here. So we had um, three parameters. We had alpha, which is the parameter of the distribution over clusters. That's going to uh, determine how many clusters we expect to see. It, the higher alpha is, the more clusters we're going to have. We have a gamma, which is the parameter of that shared distribution over nodes. The larger that is, the more nodes we expect to see. And then we have these, these parameters tau, this is the uh, specific um, cluster distributions. Those will partially um, control the number of nodes, um, but they're also going to control how much similarity there is uh, between the groups. So let's take a look at what this looks like. So here are a couple of synthetic networks that I've generated. So let's say no sort of the ground truth clustering. So here I have um, nodes, uh, a graph generated according to a block structure, right? So uh, people tend to connect with people within their blocks. And here at the top, I have colored people by um, their uh, cluster, and I've drawn the graph between them. And then on the bottom, I have something similar, but it's a little noisier, and it's got um, overlapping blocks. Right? So here the color is their most probable cluster assignment. And here I have plotted the uh, clusterings that we get if we run this mixture of Dirichlet network distributions on the same graph. So here, uh, remember, it's the edges that are clustered. So I've colored the edges based on their individual cluster memberships. Right? The edges in the um, ground truth weren't clustered. I just generated them according to this distribution. But I've colored the nodes based on their most frequent edge color. So here, the blue nodes, I've got two shades of blue, let's say the orange nodes are the nodes where the majority of their edges are colored orange. And we end up getting a very similar um, structure back as we intended, because we're capturing the um, similarities between these communication structures. Okay, so this is nice. We've got a model um, that has clustering behavior. 
and that can grow in a non-parametric way. But maybe we want more than that. Maybe we're greedy. So currently we have a model um, that is built on Dirichlet processes, or we can alternatively express it in Chinese restaurant processes. So let's think about what that looks like. And I'm going to strip away the hierarchy for now and just go back to that basic model where we sample sender and recipient from a single Dirichlet process. Okay, just because that's easier to visualize um, pictorially. So in that case, we're picking senders and recipients with probability proportional to their degree. So let's say I first pick the first one as my first sender. Then I'm either going to pick that node again, or I'm going to pick a new one. Let's say I pick a new one. Those are my first sender and recipient, so I stick an edge between them. I then either sample one of these two previous nodes with probability, in this case, proportional to one, or I sample a new one. Let's say I sample a new one for the sender. And then let's say I sample an old one for the recipient. I add that edge. Sample an old one, sample another old one. Now I've got an edge going back between two and one, and so on. So I build up my network by sampling from this Chinese restaurant process where my customers are the um, degree, basically. Now, remember from last time, Chinese restaurant processes um, don't depend on the order, right? I'd be just as likely to get this structure if I'd seen the uh, edges in a different order. Is that true of real networks? Probably not, right? We have evolution, right? not um, today maybe everyone is uh, following Obama, um, but no one was following him before he was president. Uh, so it isn't necessarily reasonable to assume that our distributions are exchangeable. So let's see how we can modify this to give something that evolves over time. So I very briefly um, at the end of last time mentioned some modifications that we can make to the distributions that we've seen. And in particular, I mentioned a uh, model called the distance dependent Chinese restaurant process. Uh, that assumes that people come into their um, restaurants, sit at tables, but at a certain point they leave. Or more generally, um, maybe they don't leave, but their contribution to the table wanes over time. For now I'm going to assume that they just leave, so at a certain point of time their contribution drops to zero. And this means that our clustering is no longer exchangeable. So let's say we start as we did before. We have our sender, that's our first node. We're going to uh, pick a recipient. So it's going to be itself with probability proportional to one or something new with probability proportional to alpha. So let's say we pick something new and we add an edge. So this starts exactly the same as the previous graph. Then I'm going to uh, pick a sender, probability proportional to alpha, pick a recipient, here probability proportional to one, pick an edge. This is exactly the sequence that we had on the previous slide. Um, so far, the graph is identical. But let's say now we forget that that edge was there. Right? It's still there, but we're not counting it in our probabilities. So now the probability of picking uh, V3 as a sender is proportional to one. The probability of picking V2 as a sender is proportional to one, but the probability of picking V1 as a sender is proportional to zero, right? We've got nothing to repeat uh, back to that. Um, so at this point in the previous graph, I picked a new edge that went from V1 to V3. I can't do that now. I have forgotten that V1 exists because I've forgotten 
all of the edges coming to and from it. So let's say I pick V2 as the, as the sender, and then a new edge as the recipient. I add my edge, um, and then I forget the second edge that came in, right? So here, um, I now can only choose between V2, V4, and something new. So let's say I pick a new edge, I then pick V4 and add that edge there. Now, what I'm describing here is kind of an extreme. Um, we would probably would have edges stick around for longer than this. I just only have the patience to do uh, five edges here. Um, and rather than have them disappear entirely, I could have them, for example, count as half an edge um, for the probability purpose. Or I can have them count as some proportion that decays with time. So this now is capturing the idea that when I'm sampling a new edge, I'm forgetting things that happened a long time ago. I'm focused on the recent edges. So this means that I'm going to get something that evolves over time, right? It is um, not the same probability that I see this graph as if I saw V5, then V4, then V2, right? I can only see graphs that are consistent with my ordering. Now, I've explained this in terms of just that simple um, non-hierarchical model Right, where we don't have the cluster and we don't have the different distributions. But I can use this at every point in my model. Right? So I can use it on those um, low level distributions that allows me to forget edges associated with a specific cluster. Right? And this would mean that a cluster's uh, topic, for want of a better word, will evolve over time. Right? Maybe it started off people talking about um, neural networks, and then they started talking about Bayesian stuff because they'd heard all of the great Bayesian speakers um, in this workshop, in this um, summer school. We can also use it in our clustering model. So that Dirichlet process that we use to cluster um, the distributions over nodes, right? So that would then allow certain communities, certain clusters to become both more and less important over time. Okay, so this is great. We've captured almost everything that we wanted to. What about sparsity? Have we got that? Now, remember, sparsity happens when we have the number of edges grow slow relative to the number of nodes, right? So technically, it's when we have a number of edges that is subquadratic in the number of nodes. So we're going to tend to get sparse as we're adding, uh, if we're adding edges um, quicker, sorry, if we're adding nodes quicker. If we never add any new nodes, we're going to be dense because we're going to have more edges than we have nodes. Now, the mixture of Dirichlet network distributions does not actually generate sparse graphs, right? Um, the rate at which we add nodes is not quick enough to make it sparse. Right? So um, we're adding edges one by one, but we're not adding nodes quickly enough to stop um, it becoming dense. So if we want to capture sparsity, then we're going to need to make the probability of picking a new node be bigger. Right? We want um, that probability of starting a new table to stay big enough to uh, make sure we're adding enough edges, enough nodes. Now, normally in the CRP, we add a new node, a new table, with probability proportional to alpha. But it's only proportional to alpha, and it's actually going to be alpha over n plus alpha. So that probability of seeing something new is going to decrease over time. And we're more likely to see an existing table that we're going to pick with probability 
proportional to the number of people at that table over n plus alpha. So what we're going to do is we're going to steal some of that probability from the existing tables and put it onto that new table. Okay? And that will allow us to grow the number of nodes uh, quick enough because we've got a higher than normal probability of seeing something new. So every table or every node that we've seen so far, we're going to steal some amount sigma of probability from that. And that's going to be a number between zero and one. It can't be bigger than one because otherwise we'd have negative probability for things that only have one node and that doesn't make sense. Um, and it doesn't really make sense for it to be less than zero in this case. So we're going to pick between zero and one. If it's zero, then we just have our Chinese restaurant process. But if it's greater than zero, it's taking away probability from those existing tables. So let's say we've got K plus tables so far. So K plus nodes in our network. That means we're going to pick a new table or a new node um, with probability proportional to alpha plus the number of tables we've got times sigma. And this keeps the probability of getting a new table that little bit more alive. It's still going to increase, sorry, it's still going to decrease because the number of tables does not um, increase as quickly as n, right? But it's going to decrease a little bit slower. And we can show that um, that increase decreases slowly enough that we still have a sparse graph, right? The rate at which um, the probability of a new graph decays um, isn't, sorry, the, yeah, the rate at which a new node decays um, is slow enough that we're still adding nodes at a, big, a quick enough rate to keep it sparse. Um, so this is something that uh, Crane and Dempsey showed for that sort of simple graph that we've been talking about, where we don't have a hierarchy. Um, we can also um, use it in our hierarchical graphs. Um, so this paper on the right here, what we did was we uh, took our mixture of Dirichlet network distributions, we replaced that top level distribution with this structure, it's known as a pittman yaw distribution, um, where we're uh, putting extra probability onto the new nodes. And then we use the distance dependent CRPs on the bottom level nodes, so that we also have dynamics. And we can prove um, that this is going to give a sparse graph, and we're not going to prove it um, because, you know, this is coming to the end of uh, the session and I think we've had enough math for one day. So instead, I'm just going to show you some pretty pictures that show we get sparsity. Right, so here I plotted the number of edges versus the number of vertices. Um, and I've done this on a log scale. So remember, we count our network as sparse if the number of edges um, grows subquadratically in the number of nodes. So that means if the slope on this log log scale is less than two. So here I have plotted two on the graph, right? That's that dashed blue line. And we see that if we increase this sigma parameter, we get sparser and sparser graphs. So the top left with sigma equals zero, that's where we don't have any additional probability added to the new nodes. Right? We are um, just following our standard Dirichlet CRP, and we end up with the number of edges um, growing quickly relative to the number of vertices. So remember, in this case, we have a integer graph. So we can actually have the number of edges more than n squared because we can have 50 edges between two people. And it turns out that um, thinking about what behaviors we have in real networks and modifying our models to capture those behaviors means we get better performance. Um, so here I've just put, so I have some numbers to back that up, uh, basically. Um, this is a subset of a series of experiments that we did 
um, to look at how good various graph models were at predicting um, new edges in the, uh, in the network. And we had three uh, networks that evolved over time. One is a set of emails. Um, one is a social network and the other is a sort of interaction network about co from college students. We looked at a couple of performance, HIPS at K and average precision at K. These are basically higher is better models for seeing um, how well we can predict what's going to happen in future. And the model I've got on the right here is an example of a um, graph that a model that doesn't have this infinite flavor where we're not growing over time. We're not allowing us to see new nodes. Um, and that does much poorer than in the middle. We have our basic mixture model where we have that hierarchical distribution of Dirichlet processes where we can add new nodes over time and we're capturing that clustering behavior. And then on the left, we have our dynamic sparse extension where we do better again because we've captured um, these, uh, the fact that real networks tend to be sparse or at least can be sparse and they tend to evolve over time. Okay, so I've been asked to leave some time at the end for um, the discussion. Um, so I hope that this has given you sort of a taste of both what Bayesian nonparametrics is, right? this idea of using infinitely dim infinite dimensional objects uh, to construct distributions, and also a bit of idea of how we can actually use that in practice, how we can match that infinite dimensional structure to real world examples. Now, I have focused on things that are based around the Dirichlet process. That's kind of the fundamental Bayesian non-parametric uh, model. Um, but there are others that you can also look into uh, if you're interested. So for example, there are distributions over subset selection, which you can use to get a non-parametric version of factor analysis, where the number of factors grows to infinity. That's something called the Indian buffet process. There are a number of distributions over trees. Um, so for example, the polyotree, tree, Dirichlet diffusion tree, and there's a number of distributions that you can use for applications such as survival analysis and a whole bunch more that I haven't, um, I couldn't think of when writing this slide. Um, so whatever your application is, if it has some sort of dimensionality flavor, there probably is a non-parametric prior that can cover it. There's also the Gaussian processes, which um, I believe might have been touched on in different uh, courses this week, um, that also fall loosely under the Bayesian non-parametric umbrella. They have slightly different behavior, but they're still in the class of infinite dimensional objects. I've um, not focused on inference because I know people have a lot of different backgrounds. So I didn't want to delve into, here's how we write a Gibbs sampler. Here's how we do inference in these, because the way that you prefer to do inference is going to very much depend on your background. Are you used to variational inference? Are you used to Gibbs sampling? Are you used to working more in an optimization framework? Um, there's a whole lot of work on this. People have come up with all sorts of algorithms. Uh, but if you want to play with this, I would suggest um, starting off with one of the implementations that already exists. Um, so if you use either PyTorch or TensorFlow, um, then there are implementations in the probabilistic versions of those, uh, Pyro and TensorFlow probability. So if you search Pyro Dirichlet process tutorial or TensorFlow probability Dirichlet process tutorial, you'll be able to get things from that. There's also a number of specific packages that people have written that are more um, designed for Bayesian non-parametrics. So there's one called BNPy in Python, unsurprisingly. There's a Julia package called BNP. And then there's also PyMCMC, which isn't specifically based in non-parametrics, but has a lot of support for it. So hopefully this has inspired you to try some of these out, to play around. And even if not, um, maybe it's inspired you to think about the role of dimensionality in your problems 
and how you can um, be flexible in specifying that dimensionality. Thank you.